Welcome back. You're watching The Globe. The Biden administration has invited Taiwan to its summit for democracy next month. The State Department announcement has prompted sharp criticism from China. The Chinese government considers the self-rule island as its territory. The summit makes good on a pledge uh, President Biden made during his uh, election campaign. It also reflects uh, his emphasis on returning the U.S. to a global leadership position amongst world democracies. The event is aimed at gathering government, civil society and private sector leaders to work together on fighting authoritarianism and global corruption and defending human rights. The invitation list features 110 countries, including Taiwan, but does not include China or Russia. The inclusion of Taiwan comes as tensions between the U.S. and China have ramped up over America's approach to the island nation. The United States one-China policy recognizes Beijing as the government of China but allows informal relations and defense ties with Taipei. Well, for more analysis on this story, we now uh, uh, we, we take uh, the already tense uh, relations between U.S. and China. We're now joined by Professor of International Relations at the University of the Witwatersrand, Professor John Stremler. Prof, always good to talk to you. Um, is this America almost um, goading China? Well, Peter, it's uh, more complicated, needless to say. And I suspect that uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden uh, were both pretty clear to each other that this invitation would go forward. And the first report I heard out of China was that they thought it was a mistake. The Reuters and other journalists have talked about uh, Chinese being infuriated, infuriating by, by, by the uh, invite. But I think it's um, a, a question of trying to manage a very sensitive issue, Peter. So um, what, what is the hope uh, for Taiwan to be there, for Biden to have Taiwan there? Well, Biden really is committed to Taiwan. And I guess I would say I am too, because Taiwan is a democracy. Uh, and it has become a democracy that is very vibrant. It's, it's regarded as a liberal democracy. Uh, the Chinese government is trying to maintain uh, support publicly for a Han ethnically defined China. And sure, Taiwan is Han, but it also has other um, diverse groups of uh, minorities. And in the case of China, of course, it's persecuting its Muslim minority. It is, it is trying to, in fact, ironically, uh, mimic the uh, ethnic nationalism that has defined the modern state. South Africa is a real break with that uh, notion of an ethnic uh, uh, democracy. We are a pluralistic, constitutional, democratic democracy. That's a harder country to hold together, as we all know. But it is, uh, I think, a step forward in terms of, uh, of political evolution. And uh, for, for, for China to annex and, and convert the, the Taiwanese involuntarily, like is happening in Hong Kong, would be a real setback for democracy, I believe. Of course, there's an irony here, Peter, because International Idea, the Swedish NGO, just recently released its global survey of, of democracies around the world, and uh, it, it downgraded the United States of America because under Donald Trump, who refused to accept the results of the election and lied about the outcome and still is causing all sorts of mayhem, uh, it was very much an attack on the fundamentals of any democracy. So America is not about uh, uh, being a perfect democracy by any means. All right, so where does this put Taiwan? I mean, the U.S. doesn't recognize Taiwan as a sovereign state, but it is almost being treated as if it is one. Does this give it more momentum, or it's just so far away into the future if it does ever happen? I think it does um, send signals that the best thing to do is to let the Chinese work this out among themselves. 
Uh, the Taiwanese had no dealings with the mainland uh, years ago when they first took over the island and were recognized as the uh, legitimate spokes. Of, uh, I, I was thought that, that was kind of crazy. And remember, I worked for Jimmy Carter, who normalized relations with, uh, with, with the People's Republic of China. And there was this creative fiction, political fiction, that allowed the United States to maintain its relations with Taiwan de facto uh, and, uh, uh, and still recognize uh, the People's Republic of China as the legitimate spokesman for mainland China. Uh, but there, there is this question about how far they could extend that. And of course, as I said again, to, to, to just extend it for ethnic uh, solidarity uh, is not democratic. Uh, and there are an awful lot of countries that are going to this summit that, uh, that Biden has convened that are hardly demo the democracies, the People's Republic of, uh, of the Congo, uh, the Angola, Iraq, Kenya, Malaysia, Pakistan. I could go down the list. Uh, in fact, 28 percent of, uh, according to the Carnegie Endowment, are partly free. 69 percent are totally free. And Taiwan would be ranked in that. Three percent are not free. But it was uh, a, a, a series of compromises. India is going, for example. Brazil is going. And they'd be Become more increasingly autocratic in their in their strongman leaders of uh, Bolsonaro and, and Modi. So it's a very mixed picture. I don't think this is a matter of, uh, of, of a real turning point in in U.S. China relations. And I would like to add, Peter, a very important point: the the forum for for Chinese African cooperation (FOCAC) is meeting at the end of this month in Dakar, Senegal. This is a perfect opportunity for Africans to speak out of the need to use Africa as a confidence building between China and the United States. You know, Taiwan is a hot problem, but it's a manageable problem if people don't put too much uh, pressure on either side, uh, domestically or internationally, to, to clarify the ambiguities. Uh, and, and, and at the same time, find practical ways for China and America to cooperate as G and Biden have said they would do. Why not Africa, if an African agency sets the agenda? We'll talk about uh, Africa, China and Taiwan uh, just now, but still with the U.S. and China over this uh, um, summit, this uh, democracy event, can China do anything about it other than perhaps just issue a, a terse statement? Because they had warned America saying that trying to encourage Taiwanese independence is playing with fire, I think Xi Jinping said. Uh, look, it is a sensitive issue, and we all know that. And the Chinese have uh, intruded on Taiwanese airspace recently. The United States did this nuclear submarine deal with Australia um, in order to, and, and, and India, the, the Troika, in order to send a signal to China. There is jockeying back and forth. They, the, the main problem for everybody, everybody, South Africa included, is to keep this problem down the road, kick it down the road. Let the Chinese gradually sort out their differences. Maybe there can be sometimes some sort of confederation. I don't much care, but I do care if uh, an authoritarian government, which China clearly is, imposes its authority over Hong Kong, over the Uyghurs, or over China, uh, the Muslim uh, minority in, 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 uh, in China, or over Taiwan, if the Taiwanese people vote strongly that they don't want to re be reincorporated in authoritarian China. That's their prerogative. It is a territory that has definition and separate nature, even though they are Han Chinese, but, but they're Democrats. That's a very big difference. It's like North Korea and South Korea. Yeah, I mean, Taiwan is definitely a holy cow. China has been coming into the continent uh, significantly uh, over many, many years. And one gets a sense that um, if you're an African nation and you have established some kind of relationship with China, that you could get punished if you are seen to be endearing yourself uh, too much with Taiwan. Well, of course, and that's good reason for Africans to say this is a China problem or a China-American problem, but we in Africa have our own democratic agenda. Democracy is despite the setbacks, 
that are noted in that in that idea, idea uh, as a summary that I global survey that I mentioned earlier. Despite the setbacks, rising illiberalism, the problems of democracy here in South Africa, the continent is still overwhelmingly, for its own reasons, for its own good reasons, it's a very diverse continent, to have peaceful political discourse about common problems and shared problems and try to keep them within bounds democratically. And so that's why the African Charter for Democracy, Elections, and Governance is so important and why the African Union's Constitutive Act is important that supports democracy. They do it for their own reasons. They're not doing it to please the West. They're doing it because this is a framework for integration of Africa. And the Chinese go along with that, uh, Peter. I've, I've been on election missions. And the Chinese have sent election missions to Guinea or to, to uh, Madagascar or wherever. And they, 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 they had the FOCAT summit in South Africa. They can coexist with South Africa and with democracy in Africa. Fine. America can. Uh, I think that the, China, the, that the Africans have good relations with China and good relations with America, as Cyril Ramaphosa said, and that's to the good of everybody, everybody. All right, let's talk about those that have uh, not been invited. China, I guess, they wouldn't have come anyway uh, once they found out that Taiwan's going to be there. But Russia is um, a bit upset, suggesting that uh, Biden is only further dividing the world, not uniting it. Well, come on. I mean, Putin <laughs> is Putin. I mean, that's an autocrat, <laughs> all likes of which we've never seen. Ukraine is hardly a, a, a card-carrying democracy, but I, I, I gather is invited. And that's as provocative as inviting Taiwan, but I think it's necessary. I mean, I, I really think we're in a, in, a, in a transitional world between uh, human rights and, and sovereign rights. And the principle of non-indifference in Africa is a suggestion that this transition is going on. South Africa's own solution to its terrible, terrible problem of apartheid was turning uh, enemies into adversaries. And so it is a multiracial democracy. And, and, uh, and, and that's real progress. But uh, it's not a perfect democracy, as we all know, as we've been thrashing out over the, these local elections. So I think that what you, what you want to see is people operating within certain limitations. And I think Biden understands perfectly well, can't push Xi Jinping too hard. But Xi Jinping, for his part, and this is trickier for him because of all the domestic pressure he has to reun reunite with, with uh, the, the Hans abroad, the uh, Han Chinese. Uh, uh, has to also exercise some restraint, uh, and, uh, and, and, and let's hope that we don't go off the cliff. So is this helping Joe Biden position himself and position America as a leading nation, uh, a, a country that wants to lead again? <laughs> well. That's what the rhetoric is, Peter. What the reality is, is that America's democracy is in a perilous state. The country is highly polarized. Joe, uh, uh, Donald Trump got 70 million votes. Imagine, he's a racist, he's a liar, he's a cheat, and yet he's got this attractiveness because white, Christian, aging Americans are fearful that uh, America is becoming more like South Africa a country united in its diversity. And uh, you can just see the, the Biden cabinet. You can see the Biden appointments. You can see it today in, in who he appointed for his Office of Management budget. He's, he's diversifying. He is, is, is making America uh, the rainbow nation that it should be, for heaven's sakes, because the world is a rainbow nation. And that's how we'll confront the problems of the 21st century, is if we're all treated with respect and equality. but. Authoritarian regimes or ethnic nationalist regimes, which is what most of Europe is, by the way, because they, they persecuted their minorities uh, the same way the Americans did with the American natives they found when they settled and took over the country as colonialists. Uh, they put them into Bantu stands. And, and so, you know, we're in a, in, a, in a very important moment in time, but this summit is not going to make much difference one way or the other. It's a grab bag of of vague ideas as far as I'm concerned, but Biden felt he ought to send a signal and he's doing it. And the bureaucrats agreed on who would be attending, but 110 nations 
uh, many of them don't probably deserve to be there in a, in a technical term or an academic term, but they're there. And others are excluded, uh, including Turkey and Hungary. Professor John Stremler, we'll leave it there. Thank you very, very much indeed. Always good getting your insights on these issues. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Peter. All right, that's uh, Professor John Strimler speaking to us. Uh, he's an uh, international relations uh, lecturer at Wits uh, University. All right, still lots more to come.